Hi everyone! Thanks for joining us today on this presentation on the Artworks 2 Media Arts Grant Opportunity. My name is Jax DeLuca and I'm the Media Arts Director for the National Endowment for the Arts. Joining us on this phone call are Media Arts Specialist Sarah Metz and Sarah Burford. During this presentation, we're going to cover three areas of information. First, We'll share general information about the NEA and how to prepare an application to the media arts discipline. Second, we will review the eligible project types for the Artworks II Media Arts Grant Opportunity in July. After that, we'll give examples of successful Artworks II Media Arts grant recipients alongside tips and tricks for crafting a strong proposal. At the end of the presentation, we will have approximately 25 minutes to answer any specific questions you may have. Before we get started, I want to mention a few technical housekeeping notes. All webinar participants will be muted during the formal part of this webinar. During the Q&A session at the end, you'll be able to submit questions or comments using the Q&A box located below the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible during the time we have. In addition, please take note that we will not be responding to the raise hand button during this webinar. In a few days, this webinar will be archived and available in the webinars section of Of the NEA website at arts.gov. We're going to start the presentation by giving a brief overview of the National Endowment for the Arts. We are a public agency dedicated to strengthening the creative capacity of our communities by providing all Americans with diverse opportunities for arts of participation. We are the nation's only arts funder to award grants in every congressional district across all 50 states and six U.S. territories, which includes Puerto Rico and Guam. I'm sure many of you may have questions about our 2018 budget, and as a reminder, the President's budget request is the first step in a very long budget process. The agency continues to operate as usual and is accepting applications for all of our regularly scheduled deadlines. It's also important for you to know that the NEA is not able to advocate on its own behalf and we are unable to answer any questions regarding the budget during this webinar. However, we do welcome you to visit our website for an official statement from our chairman, Jane Chu, regarding the budget, alongside a section of frequently asked questions concerning this topic. Before we get started, I'd like to mention a couple of other funding categories at the NEA. Challenge America, offers support primarily to small and mid-sized organizations for projects that extend the reach of the arts to underserved populations. The Our Town Grant Program supports creative placemaking projects that help to transform communities with the arts at their core. More information about these and other funding opportunities is available on our website. Last but not least is the Artworks Program which we are focusing on today. The Artworks program is the largest funding category at the NEA and supports projects spanning the 14 discipline categories that you see on the slide. Today, we are focusing this webinar on the second Artworks Media Arts deadline because it's a bit unique. Typically, organizations may only submit one application to any of the discipline categories under the Artworks guidelines. However, there is an exception to this rule. If you have submitted an Artworks application to any other discipline category, including the Media Arts deadline in February, you are still able to submit an application for this opportunity in July. An organization may also submit more than one application for this opportunity. Each application must be for a distinctly different project 
with no overlapping project costs or activities. If you have further questions about this, feel free to reach out to Sarah Metz or Sarah Burford for additional guidance. This leads us into a quick review of our basic eligibility requirements for applicants. In the Artworks Funding category, we support nonprofit, tax exempt 501c3 U.S. organizations, units of state or local government, or federally recognized tribal communities or tribes. Eligible organizations include, but are not limited to, arts organizations, art service organizations, universities, faith-based organizations, and school districts. An organization must have a three-year history of programming at the time of the deadline. If you are a newly established 501c3, any activities prior to your 501c3 designation are eligible to count towards this three-year eligibility check. Keep in mind, if your organization has received any previous NEA awards, you must be in good standing with any final reporting requirements. If you are currently in the middle of a project funded with an NEA award, you are still eligible to submit an application as long as it is for a new project or project phase. Grant requests to Artworks may range from $10,000 to $100,000. No grants will be made below $10,000. All grants require at least a one-to-one -one non federal match. In-kind matches are also eligible. We know this can get complicated, especially for organizations with volunteer staff, so please feel free to call us if you need any additional guidance. We fund projects. This means you must propose a specific project in your application. A project does not have to be new, nor does it need to be large. We welcome projects of all sizes that can make a difference in a community or field. Projects may consist of one or more specific events or activities. It is perfectly acceptable for a project to be part of your annual programmatic activities, such as a series of artist-led workshops throughout the year. Last but not least, it is helpful to know that an organization may apply for any or all phases of a project, from its planning through its implementation. Here are some items that we do not fund. The complete list is also published online in the guidelines. We do not fund general operating or seasonal support, individuals, individual schools, commercial for-profit enterprises, creation of new organizations, regranting, facility construction, purchase, or renovation, and cash reserves or endowments. A frequently asked question to Media Arts is whether or not we can fund fiscal sponsorships. The NEA cannot fund fiscal sponsorships. However, we can support partnerships between an organization and an artist. If awarded, the applicant organization is always financially and programmatically responsible for the grant from start to finish. Some examples of partnerships include commissioning, producing or co-producing, partnering on creative direction or development, organizing workshops, public showings, or distributions of work, or providing outreach and audience engagement strategies. Now we will provide a brief overview of the application life cycle for the July Media Arts deadline. Submitting an application is a two-step process. During step one, you will submit one short form, the SF-424, through grants.gov. The deadline to submit the SF-424 is July 13, 2017. We strongly encourage you to begin working on the SF-424 form several weeks in advance in case you encounter any unexpected issues with Grants.gov. In order to complete this step of the process and successfully submit the SF-424 form, you must register, renew, or verify your organization's current registration with both Grants.gov 
and the System for Award Management, also known as SAM. Failure to comply with these requirements may result in your inability to submit your SF-424 form. If you need further guidance on Step 1, complete instructions are available on our website and in the archived Artworks webinar from January. Approximately one week later, you'll complete Step 2 by submitting the rest of your application materials through an online grant application form, also known as the GAF, in the NEA web portal. The portal will be open from July 20th through July 27th to submit the full application. We strongly suggest that you have all of your materials prepared in advance. You can download a PDF of the application instructions, which includes all application questions, character counts, and additional requested materials. Be aware that the application may slightly vary from year to year. So downloading this document each year is important. In addition, each discipline may have tailored application instructions. So if you typically apply in a different discipline, be sure to download the application instruction PDF from the Media Arts webpage. The download link for this document is located on the right-hand side of the Media Arts Guidelines webpage on arts.gov. After you submit an application, it's reviewed by a panel of experts in the media arts field. The panel review process will take place in November and December of this year. Each application is reviewed and rated in accordance with our published review criteria, which is also available on our website. We strongly suggest reviewing this criteria in advance of preparing your application materials. Based on the ratings and comments gathered during the panelist review process, recommendations are then submitted for review by the National Council on the Arts. The National Council will meet in March 2018 to approve these recommendations, with the final decision on all grant awards made by the NEA Chairman. Applicants will receive notification of their application status in April 2018. For this opportunity, the earliest beginning date for NEA project support is June 1, 2018. However, it is acceptable for a project to be in the works before that date. Just remember to clearly outline the specific project activities related to the funding request in your application narrative. Next, we're going to talk about the eligible project types for the July Media Arts deadline. Eligible project types include activities that support creation, education, and resources for artistic and professional development. As we briefly go through each of these project types, keep in mind that it's perfectly acceptable for a project to contain a mix of project activities. First up is production-based projects. We support the production or commissioning of all genres and forms of media art that use electronic media, film, and technology as an artistic medium or a medium to broaden arts appreciation and awareness. Projects in this category may include, but is not limited to, film, video, or the creation of installation or expanded cinema performance works, television or radio broadcasts, web series, interactive, internet-based, or multi-platform works. All genres and all phases of a project are eligible for support. For example, recent projects include the support of production costs associated with the television broadcast series Craft in America and also production costs associated with the broadcast series on the radio called Afropop. Examples of independently produced projects include the support of post-production and distribution costs associated with the documentary Born to Fly through Aubin Pictures, and the commissioning of a new sound installation by Stephen Vitiello through the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Fine Arts. This next project type is a new addition and focuses on activities that supports the creation of analog and digital tools for artists. Some examples include the development of hardware and or software that engage the process of hacking, circuit bending, creative coding, robotics, 
and audio or visual instrument building to produce new artworks or as an artwork. Though these project activities were always acceptable in this grant opportunity, we wanted to make sure it was specifically stated in the new guidelines to welcome new applicants working with technology in this way. We also support projects We also support projects that provide resources to media artists and organizations. This may include workspace and facilities access to equipment and related technologies, as well as artist residencies that assist in any phase of a media arts production. Resources can be made available to the general public or can include a selection process for participants. Recently supported projects include the Wexner Center's Artists Residency Program, and Downtown Community Television Center's Labs and Facilities Access Program, which are open to the public. We also support educational activities and workshop series that engage groups of all ages and skill levels to learn, participate in, or explore the use of electronic media, film, and technology as an art form. Recently supported projects include Scribe Video Center's community-based workshops for youth in Philadelphia, and film independent artist development programs, which provide directing, producing, documentary, and screenwriting labs for both emerging and established filmmakers. In addition, we support projects that provide services to the media arts field. This may include conferences, field studies, or convenings that are for media arts practitioners and are open to the public. Examples of recently supported field building projects include the Alliance for Media Arts and Culture's annual conference, the Third Coast Audio Conference, and the Flaherty Film Seminar, a week-long convening that brings together filmmakers, artists, curators, scholars, students, and film enthusiasts. We also support publications on issues pertinent to the media arts field, both digital and in print. Recent examples include International Documentary Association's Documentary Magazine, which is available in print and online, and Rhizome's editorial blog on contemporary art and technology. Finally, we support the development of web portals, mobile and tablet apps, or other innovative uses of technology that provide audiences with access to media artists and artworks. Recently supported projects include an interactive web portal by Jacob's Pillow Dance, which makes a growing collection of dance videos filmed at Jacob's Pillow from the 1930s to today available online to the public. Additional examples include the production of an online audio and video content to accompany episodes of the radio broadcast Jazz Night in America, enabling each broadcast program to reach wider audiences. This concludes our list of eligible project activities for the July deadline. As a reminder, any activities related to exhibitions, such as festivals or curated screening series, preservation, or archiving are eligible in the Media Arts deadline in February. In our application instructions PDF, it is important to note that we do have a list of suggested work samples and special items to include for each project activity type. Due to the competitive nature of this opportunity, we strongly suggest that you take advantage of this to showcase, highlight, and express further detail about the nature of your project. For instance, if your project includes artist residencies or facilities access, you have the opportunity to provide a one-page list that describes your available equipment and resources. Providing such a list will give panelists further insight about your project as they are only able to make determinations based on the information you provide. Of course, if you have any questions about these supplementary materials, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. As we mentioned earlier, your application will be evaluated through a peer review process. Each application will be reviewed by five to six panelists. 
Each panelist is carefully curated by staff to bring a well-rounded perspective to the review process. Panelists read, score, and comment on applications using specifically outlined review criteria, which is available on our website. We strongly suggest that you review this criteria before preparing your application. People often wonder what the characteristics of a successful project are. Before we get more into the specifics of what panelists are looking for in each application, we want to share some examples of previously awarded projects. After we go through each project, we'll return back to this topic. First, let's take a look at the Allied Media Conference, which is an education-based field-building event put on by Allied Media Projects. Held in Detroit, this three-day field-building conference is a collaboratively designed event that brings together media artists, technologists, and educators of all ages and skill levels. Conference content is curated every year by more than 100 volunteer coordinators to organize conference tracks, practice spaces, and network gatherings. Over the course of three days, the conference features over 300 educational activities, which includes hands-on workshops, panels, film screenings, and community-based events that cover a range of topics, from digital and immersive storytelling to 16mm filmmaking. Next, we'd like to present a project from Atlantic Public Media in support of production and post-production costs for a series of Transom Radio Specials. Transom Radio Specials, a radio broadcast series produced through transom.org, channels new work and voices to public radio through the internet. Each hour-long broadcast is produced by an independent artist and focuses on personal stories, often from unusual and diverse sources, to highlight perspectives not typically represented on public radio. After each production is complete, it is distributed through multiple platforms, including the Transom website and podcast, the Public Radio Exchange, and traditional public broadcast outlets. Next, we'd like to present a project by Bay Area Video Coalition in support of their National Media Maker Program. The project supports artists working in a wide range of media art forms from documentary and interactive works to emerging technologies at all stages of production. The 10-month training program provides selected artists with access to production equipment, project development, hands-on training, and exhibition and distribution strategies to further their careers. During the program, participants work with mentors such as journalists, nonprofit partners, distributors, interactive developers, funders, and curriculum specialists to develop their projects. In addition to providing fellows with intimate feedback sessions, tailored workshops, presentations by industry veterans, and a built-in support network, the project also offers participants a stipend and additional opportunities for professional development. Next, we would like to present a project from Chicago Filmmakers which provided support for a series of professional development and education programs. Year-round, Chicago Filmmakers offers a range of educational activities to the public and serves students of all ages and abilities, from new and emerging to mid-level and established artists. These activities include workshops, seminars, panel discussions, lectures, and other related professional development programs covering a wide range of topics, such as digital and 16 millimeter filmmaking, directing, lighting, and screenwriting. Classes are taught by professionals in the local area who provide hands-on training for students of all ages and skill levels. In order to make sure all members of their community can access their services, free and low-cost programs are regularly offered. Next, we'd like to present a project by Twin Cities Public Television to support production, post-production, and outreach costs for the television program TV Takeover. 
the goal of TV Takeover was to bring artist-driven episodes of television to the airwaves. To do so, TV Takeover partnered with local, community-based arts organizations that regularly worked with a range of visual artists, filmmakers, musicians, and dancers. Each partner was given the freedom to create and curate content for a series of four one-hour-long television broadcasts, which included the use of the production studio at Twin Cities Public Television. Each episode was taped in front of a live audience and broadcast on public television and then later available online, offering audiences multiple points of access to experience the arts. Through this strategy, the project was able to forge stronger relationships with artists and organizations in the community and simultaneously attract new audiences for everyone involved. In our last example, we will highlight the production assistance program from Women Make Movies. For those not familiar with the organization, Women Make Movies supports films by and about women. Established in 1988, the Production Assistance Program is a professional development program that supports filmmakers and their projects in a variety of ways. Selected participants have access to support services such as consultations, workshops on the business and financial aspects of video and filmmaking, opportunities to present works in progress, and valuable networking opportunities. Since its inception, the program has assisted in the completion of hundreds of media arts projects, many of which have gone on to premiere at film festivals such as Sundance and Tribeca and to receive Academy Awards. We'd also like to point out that while the Production Assistance Program does include fiscal sponsorship as part of their filmmaker services, the application makes it clear this is not in their proposed project activities, therefore making the project eligible for NEA support. When speaking to applicants, we are often asked what makes a strong proposal. As a reminder, applications are reviewed based on artistic excellence and artistic merit. A breakdown of the review criteria is available on our website, and we encourage applicants to reference this when crafting their application. With that in mind, we'd now like to share some elements that help make an application competitive. Artistic excellence refers to the quality of the artists, art organizations or educational providers, works of art or services that the project will involve, as well as the artistic significance of the project, either within a specific community or the wider artistic field. This is demonstrated through a combination of your narrative, list of programmatic activities, work samples, and discipline-specific items requested in the application. For example, if you are proposing an educational activities, such as workshops or master or masterclass series, compelling samples could include work by teaching artists, work by participants in previous years, and even documentation of previous educational activities. If you are proposing a commission or production-based project, your samples can also include works from the proposed artist or previously commissioned or produced projects by your organization. If you don't have confirmed artists at the time of application, the key is to give panelists an idea of the quality of work to be produced. We wanted to mention this because applicants often ask how they can present a work sample of something that has yet to be produced. The answer is simple. If the project is a new season of an ongoing series, consider including a reel of previously produced works. If you do have an artist secured, consider including previously completed works by the artist. Panelists are also asked to evaluate applications based on artistic merit, which includes multiple factors, all of which are available on our website. One aspect involves evaluating the appropriateness of the project as it relates to the organization's mission, audience, community, or constituency. Successful projects demonstrate a clear understanding of their audience and embody the core components of their organizational mission throughout the application. 
There are several sections in the application where you can provide more information on these aspects. For example, if you are offering professional <coughs> development opportunities for media artists and the target audience of your program is support of emerging artists from underserved communities, it helps to clearly demonstrate your access and level of involvement with your stated target audience in the project narrative. Throughout the application, panelists will assess the range of organizational partners, the scope of support provided to artists, and how the organization contextualizes their relationship with the beneficiaries that they intend to serve. An unsuccessful application may be the result of unclear outreach plans, too many questions from panelists about the need for a project, or no confirmed or proposed organizational partners. It is perfectly acceptable to include proposed partners in your application, even if they are not yet confirmed. This allows panelists to see how you are working within your community or the media arts field at large. Project feasibility also plays a key factor in determining artistic merit. You can demonstrate feasibility through the project's timeline, key artists or individuals involved, a project's partnerships or an organization's capacity. For example, if you're proposing a production project, make sure your timeline is realistic based on your organization's capacity and previous experience. Feasibility can also be reflected in the budget, as panelists will be looking to see if the size of the budget is appropriate for the project, whether or not the project will adequately pay artists, and if there is a diversified match for the project's revenue. For example, if a project budget's match is solely comprised of in-kind matches or a single revenue source, panelists may note that the budget does not display diverse sources. In most cases, competitive applications have a variety of revenue sources, both proposed and confirmed, in their project budget. This demonstrates to panelists that the organization is not over-reliant on a single source of revenue stream and signifies a level of buy-in from the community or other funders. This also gives assurance that if any proposed revenue source falls short, it will not prevent the project from taking place. Since we support all or any phases of a project, it's perfectly acceptable to focus on the activities of one particular phase. Just make sure this is clear in your application narrative and budget by stating this in the very beginning of your project narrative and tailoring your budget accordingly. Another criteria within the evaluation of artistic merit includes evaluating the appropriateness of the, pro of the proposed performance measurements. For example, if you are an incubator program that has an open call for artists, metrics can include a variety of things, from capacity, such as tracking the number of applicants, the number of artists the project serves, and the length of the program, to impact, which could be tracking the accomplishments of previous program participants. This is often a difficult portion of the proposal for applicants. We have some resources on our website for evaluating different types of projects. The Artworks Resources box, located on the right-hand side of the Media Arts Guidelines page on our website, includes links to program evaluation resources, as well as sample application narratives, archived webinars, and an applications checklist. Again, you can find this box on the right-hand side of the Media Arts Guidelines webpage on arts.gov. Finally, a successful application will be clearly written and contain a compelling narrative. Less successful applications may get bogged down in jargon, lack clarity, or try to fit too much in the project narrative. Remember that each panelist is tasked to review between 30 and 40 applications, so we strongly advise keeping descriptions simple and accessible. In addition, remember that panelists may be learning about your project for the first time, so you don't want to whelm, overwhelm them too much with inf too much information in a small amount of space. Use your character count wisely to make a compelling narrative. 
consider the application as more than just a series of questions. Be mindful of the way that you address each section, as this is how panelists will evaluate your project based on the criteria we've just talked about. All right, so we've now reached the end of our formal presentation for the webinar, and we've covered a lot of material, so we're sure that you have some questions for us. At this point, you're welcome to submit questions using the Q&A box, which is located at the PowerPoint, or it's located below the PowerPoint on your screen. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible in the time available, and it does look like we have 25 minutes, so um, ask away. I think the first question that um, we see up here is um, just a quick question about application, the number of applications that you can put in, and um, if you applied in Artworks in February, someone is asking if you can also apply in July, and yes, if you've applied to the Artworks, any funding category in February, you can also put in an application in July. There is also another question that uh, if you have not submitted in February, if you can submit in July, and the answer is yes, of course, you can submit an application in July, even if you haven't put in any other application. However, if it is your first time going through with this application, uh, feel free to call us if you have any questions throughout the process. And as a reminder, use the resources on the right side of the web page and download the application PDF from our webpage because that will make your life a lot easier. Uh, we have a question about funds and matching funds, um, whether they have to be cash or if they can be in a form of in-kind services. And the answer is yes, uh, in-kind does, does count. Um, as we said in the presentation, while they do count, uh, the most competitive applications have a diversity of funding streams. So keep that in mind, but in-kind absolutely does count. And the second part of the question is, when must you have the matching grant funds available? And that answer is, uh, were, were you to be awarded a grant, you would need to have the funds secured by the end of your grant period, and you would work with our grants office to make sure that that happened. Um, with that in mind, you know, it's it I, as we said, you submitting as many Funding streams, as you know, at the time of the application, makes for the most compelling. Um, if you if you don't have funds secured, but you know we're going to apply to this foundation and we're going to do a Kickstarter campaign and that, things like that, you can certainly include that in your budget, and um, you indicate uh, you indicate funds that are secured with a little asterisk, so that way the panelists know. They're going to this source for funding, and they have this source secured. OK, we have another question about uh, submitting an additional application to Media Arts in July. Someone's asking if they submit um, an application to, let's say, folk and traditional arts in July. Can we also apply for the media arts deadline? And the answer is yes. And the key is really just to make sure that each of your applications is for a distinct set of project activities and that there are no overlapping costs uh, between or activities between those two applications. And of course, in media arts, unlike some of the other artworks, NEA disciplines, we do divide up our deadlines by project types. So certainly in July, you'll want to make sure you're coming in for one of the eligible project types in media arts. And again, always feel free to reach out to uh, Sarah Metz or myself, Sarah Burford, with any questions um, about distinguishing uh, some of these eligibility rules. Uh, so we have a question, is there a date by which your project must be completed? And the answer is um, yes and no. Uh, we 
when, when you submit an application, your period of support really should not extend beyond two years. We would not initially fund anything beyond two years. And traditionally, people tend to come in for just one year at a time. But you can come in for up to two years, uh, particularly with production-based projects. Sometimes it's a two-year period. Um, at the end of that two-year period or the, or the year period, there may be an opportunity to extend if needed, but initially it's the one to two years. And I'll just also add that you can come in for any phase of a project. So let's say you are coming in for the production um, of a film and uh, you wanted to come in for the post-production part, but you had already submitted, you know, uh, you had already completed some production, that's fine. So we know that production projects can take, you know, five, six years to complete. So keep that in mind. You can come in for any phase. We have another question about eligible project activities. Someone um, is asking if archival activities are eligible in July, and the answer is no. Any activity that has to do with preservation or archiving are eligible in the media arts deadline in February. So uh, do be, be a little mindful about the different eligible project activities that are listed on the media arts webpage. We have an excellent question about uh, is there a difference between the new between the NEA Go system and the new NEA web portal? Um, the answer is yes, there is. Uh, you know, the I believe we're sort of in progress with that, but um, the uh, but the it will essentially be the same in that it will still be a two-step process. You will still submit your SF-424 through grants.gov, and then submit the rest of your application materials through a different, you know, through the new NEA web portal, which, just like you did with NEA Go, um, the actual system will be different, and we will provide people, um, applicants, with information on that closer to the deadline. Thanks for your patience, everyone. We're just going through all the questions as they come in. We do have a question about coming in for production costs. And we're just pulling up the question, um, which would include professional recording for something to be broadcast publicly. This would be an eligible activity in the July deadline, as long as it, as it was for the production costs, or any actually any phase of the project would be eligible for support. Um, we would just in the uh, supplemental materials, you'll have uh, the opportunity to outline your outreach plan, which could be for broadcast. Okay. 
We have a question about fiscal sponsorship, which is um, if your project has been fiscally sponsored, can you apply to us, you know, through a different, uh, through a different revenue stream? And that answer is is yes. Um, you know, let's say you have a fiscal sponsor, but you are partnering with another organization for a different aspect of your project. That is fine. Um, one of the special items that we ask for, discipline specific items that we ask for for production projects is to explain your relationship between the applicant organization and the artist. And there is your opportunity to basically um, tell us how this is not a fiscal sponsorship. Um, so yes, you can do that. That is perfectly acceptable. We do have a question about if music production and music technology is eligible for funding in July. And we did open up a new project type this year, which does focus on activities that supports the creation of analog or digital tools for artists. So if you're developing uh, hardware or software that has to do with audio or visual instrument building, uh, to generate new artworks, whether or not that's sound or audiovisual, um, those types of projects are certainly eligible in the July deadline. If you do require um, a little bit more guidance on that, you can always call us to talk about the work samples and things like that and how to present the project. Okay, we have a great question about um, a, pro a project that is the production of a podcast or a broadcast project. The question is if the topic or content of it needs to be related to the arts. Um, and the answer is yes, that uh, the, the NEA support, helps support projects that are about um, broadening awareness of the arts and arts appreciation, um, access to uh, media artists and artworks. Okay, we have a great question um, asking if, if you work with a partner organization can both organizations apply for funding on the same project? And the answer is no. Um, if you're working with a partner organization, one of you, uh, hopefully the one that is the 501c3 nonprofit with three years of programmatic activity, um, would apply on behalf would apply for the project. But if you both apply for the same project, um, that would not be eligible, and we would have to sort that out. Um, on our end, but uh, please, you know, you cannot apply for the same project in the same deadline. All right, we have another question. Is there a funding cap? And yes, there is a funding cap. Uh, Artworks grants range from $10,000 to $100,000. No grant will be made over or above those amounts. An average grant is around twenty to thirty thousand dollars, and I think that pretty much covers that. So keep your ask within ten to a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, we have a great question about um, educational programs working with communities that are new to media arts and how to demonstrate artistic excellence in uh, the samples you provide or in the application as a whole. Um, and there are a couple strategies that you can think about in doing this. Um, you can uh, demonstrate the work of teaching artists or mentors, others who might be involved with the program, um, 
or you can also include, um, if it's a new program, you can include samples of other kinds of programs that your organization might have run that are similar, or if the program has been around for a couple years, you can um, in consider including samples um, about the documentation of work, but certainly our panelists are aware that when working with students, for example, or um, novice media makers, that um, you know the that uh, they're <laughs> the the uh, quality and excellence are um, judged on factors based uh, such as the um, the program's outreach to its target audience. Um, and you know, so there are a couple a couple strategies that you can think about in terms of the samples. And if you have further questions about that, feel free um, to give us a call and talk about it further. Okay, we have a uh, somebody asking about work samples and uh, eligible work samples um, limitations, etc. Um, this is all covered um, in our on our website in our guidelines, but I'll just briefly go over. Um, some of the requirements. Um, we do require work samples. If you do not submit them, um, you will your your application will be incomplete. Um, we require, depending on your project type, we ask for different things. But your your basic uh, the basic takeaway is that you can submit up to three work samples, only three, and this does include like let's say you submitted um, a document with links. Each link does count as a work sample. So you can submit up to three, up to 10 minutes each, and um, applicants will not look at more than 30 minutes of a work sample, or excuse me, um, panelists will not review more than 30 minutes of work samples total. And we actually tell them this in, as, in our orientation call. Um, if you are submitting documents, like let's say you're submitting um, Sample articles, we ask no more than 12 pages total. And um, yeah, so that's, and again, this is all covered in on our website, on our guidelines. We have a uh, PDF of application instructions. And this does get sort of tricky, and it is sort of uh, very on a case-by-case -case basis. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to call um, Sarah or Sarah, as is on your screen, and we are happy to go through any of that with you. Okay, we also have a question about including operating costs in your budget. Um, this is a great question, and um, so in general, a um, you can come in for operating costs that are specific to a program only. Um, general operating costs for an organization are not eligible. Um, however, if the costs are really associated with your project, and it, this could include um, staffing, um, equipment, everything that is really specific to your project, those are eligible. And um, again, we advise you to really just be as specific as possible in your project budget. And of course, to reach out to us if you have any questions in the process. We have a question about um, funding covering update of equipment, like lighting or um, or microphones or things like that? Um, the answer is yes, if it is part of your project. If your project is just, we want to purchase new equipment, um, that is not eligible. But if your project is, we provide facilities access and training to artists, um, and we need to update some, and part of our ask is to update some equipment, that is, um, that is eligible. Do keep in mind that, um, are, were you to be awarded, if there is a cap, I believe it is $5,000, um, but I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's 5,000, I'm getting confirmation, it is $5,000. So if your equipment, uh, if one single piece of equipment goes over $5,000, you'll just need to really specify in the budget um, what that is for. And 
again, like if you were to be awarded a grant, our grants office or Sarah and myself would go over this with you, but just something to keep in mind. Okay, we also have a question about whether or not a project needs to be new. Um, and the answer is no, um, a project does not have to be new. And, um, you know, I think we, we try to discourage this need uh, or, um, you know, the idea that you really need to kind of reinvent the wheel every time you might come in for a project. Um, regular programming um, that, you know, pre-exists or has a long track record can definitely be very competitive. And um, so do not feel that you need to come in with a brand new project um, every time you submit an application. Okay, we do have another question. If we will contact you if your application is missing anything? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Because of the volume of applications, we do have a strict approach to incomplete, incomplete applications. So um, for your application to be considered complete, every item must be included in your application package, which must be submitted no later than the application deadline date. So staff will not contact applicants to request missing material. So just don't let that happen and use the how to prepare and submit an application section uh, of the Media Arts webpage. It's located on the right side of the webpage. And um, go through that checklist and make sure that you have another staff member. Double check your application. And also make sure that you allow six weeks at least to prepare your application. And all of the work samples and any of the supplementary information, um, we really um, encourage you to not wait until the day of the deadline to submit as well because the NEA GO system uh, can sometimes get a little overloaded with traffic on that last day so we do recommend that you have everything ready and then by the time that the portal opens up that you're able to take that time instead of rewriting your narrative and making work samples but just uh, putting them into the portal that we need so um, it happens more often than you think, and we really hate having stressed out application applicants. So um, call us and call us now and use the application PDF now to start preparing your work samples and narrative. Okay, we're reaching the end of our webinar, so we're going to take one final question. Um, uh, which is a great one about <laughs> whether or not a project needs to be national or is a locally focused project okay. A uh, project does not need to be national. While we do support projects um, in this deadline that have a national scope, such as broadcasting programs, a uh, locally focused project is definitely eligible and can also be very successful. Um, again, our applications are judged on the criteria of artistic excellence and artistic merit. And especially with locally focused projects, um, well, with all applications, but um, with locally focused projects, really demonstrating the impact that your audience is having on that local community, um, making sure that really shines through in your application is important um, and can certainly be a very competitive application as well. Great, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if you do have further questions about this grant opportunity, 